Okay, I think we're recording. Hello world. Welcome back. Hi. <laughs> I have the lovely Gonzalo Mott here with us today, who's a cinematographer that I worked with uh, on a pilot here in New York City. Uh, I'm really excited to have him on. Um, would My you like pleasure. to, yeah, <laughs> would you like to tell people and also me, because I don't think I know uh, how you got started in the film business and specifically within the camera department. Sure. Uh, it's kind of a, a tricky. I always um, loved still photography since I was like eight or seven or even younger. Um, so I always had a thing for, for you know, capturing moments. And, uh, and I have all these pictures from when I was eight years old, which are just not pictures that you would normally see in a kid. You know, like a lot of architectural stuff some portraits so it was kind of interesting now looking back um and then i also when i was growing up had a thing for uh literature you know like just reading a lot and and storytelling and then in my family my parents were very uh my grand my father actually um grew up in spain in the post-war and he had his family had a cinema so he used to watch a lot of the movies from the you know almost like a cinema paradiso uh, very similar time um, so that he had a, just a lot of, um, he was a huge fan of film. And I guess since very young, I was kind of into that too, you know, hey, let's watch this movie from, you know, John Ford or, you know, whatever. And uh, so there was always that thing. They, I never really thought about getting into film until later when I was in maybe high school and, and just kind of playing around with photography and, uh, and uh, storytelling someone like a teacher he saw what I was doing he told me maybe you should look into film you know because you have these two things that you really like and that you kind of played for a few years so why not try film I'm like oh interesting because in my family I don't think they thought it was like a serious career path they were like yeah you know that's kind of very artist I don't think you can make a living um so that was um how I got into it basically someone telling me you should look into it and then I didn't really study film. I studied communications, which had a part of film. And then of course, two years into it, I'm like, mm, I think I should have done film. But at the same time, it gave me some other background. Um, and then camera department, I mean, was, I guess it was just a natural thing. You know, I was always very much into camera and framing and all of that. And then I realized from, I mean, after a while, after I went to film school and all of that, I realized that I, hadn't played too much with lighting, with other parts of storytelling, that I was very, very much into framing and stuff. So that's when I start to try to work on other areas too, just to kind of educate myself on lighting and, and things like that, you know? I don't know if that makes sense. No, it totally does. Um, would you say there were certain events or maybe like a certain person that really like shaped the trajectory of your career? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, for sure, I think, there's always, uh, I mean, this teacher that told me who was a, actually like a, a film teacher. And then I also, when I wasn't sure about how to continue my path towards making films, I spoke to a director in Mexico who's uh, actually, he made a film with Rodrigo Pieto, who Rodrigo also was kind of a mentor for me all these years. And this guy, um, he told me, I asked him, so how, do you, how should you do? how should I proceed? You know, I want to make films. I, I like uh, cinematography. I like the uh, lighting. I like, uh, he told me something that I tell everyone who asked me, you know, it's like, you should invest the time in what you want to do. Because a lot of people tell me, yeah, you know, I want to be like, uh, I love production design and I love um, also editing. And I'm like, yeah, but you have to define what you like in order for you to start pushing towards that objective. So, all those people have guided me and he's um, this this director uh, who used to be an advertising director in Mexico told me you should focus on what you want and there's two paths you can either start now and go into camera department you know start working your way up or just go and do uh, film school you know so you can either do mm -hmm. either or so I, I kind of decided to go the film school uh, route but um, you know I still think both places both routes take you to the same same place in the end you know but i i do think that um advice like that it's crazy how much how many years that was probably i don't know maybe 25 years ago or so and i still every time i talk to someone who's asking me i tell them the same thing just focus on what you want to do you know 
How was that jump for you from film school to actually working on film sets? Well, another someone else who also was very interesting. I went to uh, AFI in LA and we had a lot of really great master classes with. And I remember Wally Fister, who oh, used yeah. to be also from AFI, he came and said the best thing ever was like, you guys think of yourselves as DPs and cinematographers, but you really, you're not, you're film students who are studying. When you finish, you have to start your career. Because, you know, sometimes film, film, film school will put you in that place where you think they kind of build up your ego a little too much. So when you get out, you get humbled by the, by the world. So that was really the best advice. Like, well, is you know, don't, you know, don't think that you're gonna just go out and try to compete with other VPs. You have to build a career, you know? So I think I, I really tried to do with my conviction of, of going the film school route. I didn't want to work my way when I finish. I'm like, I really have to start shooting. Mm. So I decided just to not, not do any crewing. I did a little bit of uh, working here and there, but I really focus on shooting my own stuff. So uh, starting by partnering with some friends from, from film school to try to get small projects, you know, a couple of commercials here, little spec, uh, documentaries, any, anything I could get my hands on. Um, and we did a few spec commercials too, which are, um, they stayed on my reel for a really long time. Oh yeah. Um, and then, oh yeah, yeah, because we did invest money and time on them. So they, we made them look the best possible and um, they actually paid back, you know, very well after so many years. So I think it was just really hustle, you know, like really believing that you will eventually make it and then you just kind of push for it and try to shoot as much as possible. Because another thing I, uh, another thing that I believe in is that you have to make your own uh, projects so you understand how you could tell a story from the beginning. If you work uh, on, a, on a crew or you uh, work your way up, you will always make you'll see the decisions when they're already made. Like if mm -hmm. you're working cameras or focus or um, even an all operator, you'll always see the decisions that the DP makes when they're already made. You don't really have that process. And it's kind of, it's a lot easier to say, oh, I would have done it this way than coming up with an idea of how to shoot things. So for me, that's kind of a muscle. And um, um, every time you get to, decide and work on your decision making and your style if you want that's stuff that you own it's your project and um it's a credit even if it's not great it's still you can learn from it you know uh would you say that early on maybe especially going to afi and then shooting right after that you like knew what your style was or is that something that over time you're like oh i'm gravitating toward this or i'm, I'm always kind of looking like this in my projects yeah, I think, I mean, style is kind of, for me, I, I still think that style is something that people see in your work. I don't like, I, I personally don't think I have a style. I, I, but of course, if you see my work, maybe you say, oh, okay, you like, you know, whatever. You like wide lenses or you like this or you like that. I think it's a question of what I like. So it, what, whatever you like, your taste will come through uh, in what you shoot. And but I try to think maybe a little bit of wishfully thinking that I'm able to try to do any style that uh, the story requires, you know? So that's my way of saying, I don't want to get married to a certain style. Like I, I don't, and if you, and I think I've tried to learn that from people like uh, Roger Dickens or Chivo who have so many different uh, scopes of, uh, of work, you know, like from natural available light to super something super stylized. So, I uh, try to think like that, you know, if you can use the tools that you learn and try to reinvent yourself every project, then the style maybe comes through, but I'm like, it's not something that I sell. It's more something that people see on my work. And, sure. um, and you know, it's, it's great that you, you can, after a while, you can, you can know, I mean, you know what you like. And I always mm -hmm. use the same references for film. Like when I'm uh, researching a film, I kind of always go back to the same people and the same painters and the same DPs and in the end it's like it's like well uh, that's what what I like to do you know so maybe that's what style is in the end you know do you feel like 
style can somehow, like if you relate it to say like actors being typecast, do you, have you found that certain DPs are almost like typecast by a style? Like you're, someone gets yeah. hired because they have a certain, what's like the idea of how they look? Yeah, completely. Like especially, I, I would say especially more for um, for like advertising would be the typical case in which you know that you can do almost if you do a film, you can almost shoot anything, any situation after a while, your career, you learn, learn how to do things. But when someone hires you, they want to see how they see the final thing on your reel, which is like, mm. that happens a lot. So it's um, in a way that that can make you have kind of the same, you know, repeat your own style here and there. I do think that it's um, important to try to vary, you know, in terms of what kind of projects you do. Like I did a, a couple of horror movies, which I really enjoyed. And I was going to do more, but then, you know, part of my, the people that work with me, my agents, they were like, I don't know if you should keep doing horror films because then it's going to be hard to get out, you know? And, mm. and it's true, you know, if you can do um, something that you haven't done before, it's better because then you have one more thing on your reel. And I think that's how you avoid being sort of typecast as a certain type of, uh, of DP. Um, not that it's a bad thing. Like I do think that if you find what you like, like I personally like, you know, darker material. I like uh, stuff that's relevant. And, and uh, I now after doing The Man in the High Castle, I really like period. And now I get a lot of calls for period stuff. So, and I'm like, well, I really like it. So I wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing to be typecast as a, a period as a DP, you know? So, um, I do think it's 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 a cool thing if you can be typecasting it what you like to do, you know. Yeah, just it's it's kind of curious because on um, the like behind the scenes side, like that's a decision that I'm not even close to making yet. So it's kind of cool to to hear about, and also it's curious to see how people navigate that, especially whether or not they have an agent or not. Like you know, I know certain DPs don't, but um, do you want to speak about that? What that process has been like for you? Yeah. Um, just to add to uh, more about the style, I do think that in my case, I am just generally like to work a little bit outside of my comfort zone in, okay. in, in everything I do. So having thinking about that, when I did, um, when I, they hired me to do the Man in the High Castle, I have nothing that looked like that in my reel. So it, it's great that someone trusted me with a project like that knowing that I hadn't done that style before, but at the same time, I was able to bring something different than they were looking for. They were looking for something that they saw on my reel. So that's great. If you can do more things, people will just find stuff on your work that mm -hmm. you don't even know, you know, and they'll call you, I, I, I saw this film you did in a long time ago and I like this or, so the more you do, the more scope you have to find what you eventually want to do. Uh, in terms of agents, it's, I mean, it's, it's crazy because it's always like people always tell you should have an agent, you should have an agent. And then most of the works at the beginning of, of your career, I don't think would come through agents. It would probably come through contracts, through friends, uh, you know, even your own thing that you want to do with friends or, and then sometimes an agent won't even be like, well, you found that I'm not going to negotiate that for you, you know, so. I do think that um, eventually it's it's great because then you have someone who's watching out for you and who's mm. kind of, I mean, of course, it depends on the agent, but I've been very lucky. The first agent that I met was the same guy I've been working for, uh, I don't know how long now, but it's quite a while. So he knows me from when I started. He's being very straightforward when it comes to say, this is a good project for you. This is not such a good project for you. This seems like a job. This seems like a great opportunity. So if you have someone like that to guide you, it's like, it's great. Like he pushed me to my first, um, the horror, first horror movie, which then eventually made me connect with the people of Paramount. And then I did another film with them. So, and then connected with a director and then that kind of went off to, to other places. So if you have someone who has that vision, then I think it's great. But I, I don't think you should try and find an agent before you, have some body of work yeah. it's because i think the relationship is much better if they look for you if an agent looks for you and they see your work and say let's work together it's a lot better dynamic than if you try to find an agent and nobody wants to 
hire you, like uh, take you as a client. Yeah. I do think it's better. Put you kind of in a, better, a stronger position. Sure. Um, but I do think it's, it's, you do, as your career grows, it's, it's a must, like, because you do need someone to bounce the ideas back and forth. And then some projects won't even, you won't even, you probably, unless you're someone like Jeffrey Jer, who's an amazing body of work, and he didn't have an agent for most of the time, unless you are someone like him, it's hard because you won't even know what projects are out there. Mm. And the agents, of course, have the database and they know and they have other clients there. So they are, sometimes they can sell you through the other clients. So the way that at least uh, episodic TV and studio movies and stuff is set up, I think you, you have to have an agent for sure. Um, can, would you mind telling me more? Because I don't actually know the full story. Um, what your experiencing, experience was like before you even started with Man in the High Castle. Like that show has such a visual style and I'm, I'm just not sure uh, how much of that was already in someone's mind or how much your collaboration with them created that to begin with. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, um, when I got into that, they, they had done the pilot, but then when they called me, they're like, we're looking to change a little bit of some of the things that from the pilot, we wanted to make a little more uh, character based. Um, still want to keep some of the graphic nature of it because it's still Ridley Scott and it's still, you know, strong visuals. But we want to make it a little more connected to the characters, less cold, you know. So I got to, because of scheduling, I got to do the second episode, which was kind of the second pilot, if you want to call it like that. So that was great because I had the days to prep. I had like, you know, four or five or six weeks. I, I can't even remember. It was a long prep. And then I was able to you know, hire the, hire the people. And then of course, with uh, Jim, the other DP, but he was in LA, we were bounce, bouncing ideas back and forth. But um, I was able to just implement sort of the new ideas that they wanted to bring on to the, into, into this. And then it was just a constant evolution. You know, it was like, you know, this we're pr proposing and then with the showrunner and the writers and everyone bringing ideas and every time we tried to grow more within the style. Um, and it was just really, knowing that we had the support of um, of the production company saying that, you know, this is what we're doing. We're doing a noir show, we're doing references or, you know, Blade Runner, all this, um, the conformist, the stuff that's super graphic and really stylized. And we kind of had that as, uh, and the support of Ridley Scott to say, you guys just be brave and do whatever you want. So when you're in that position, you can really play. And then of course, if you have the crew behind you that pushes you constantly, like the operators, gaffers, uh, you know, the gaffer, um, um, key grip, everyone who's really on the same page, then you can really build up on the style visually because everyone's ideas will be kind of pushing you constantly to reinvent yourself. And uh, I think it's kind of key for, uh, for TV because you can get really comfortable. You go to the same set, switch the lights on, it's lit go read reading newspaper, but if you can reinvent yourself, yeah. uh, you know, go to a set again and say, how can we not do what we did? How can we reinvent, make it feel like it, we're in a different place, go with a story. So, you know, I think in that show, it just, for me, I think the most important part of that project was the people that we hired. Like really our team was just what made that project. And for me, you know, I take, I have the credit, but I do think that everyone's work is on, yeah. on screen, you know, and that's, um, that was almost like that. That's uh, what I'm thankful about that project. It was, if you trust your team and you believe and you take the ideas, the results are just, and just a lot more than you expect from your own work, you know. Um, oh, I had a great question and then I lost it and then I'm going to find it again. Oh, uh, <laughs> I found it. Um, <laughs> uh, on a project like that, you said uh, Ridley Scott gave you a lot of freedom to be brave and to play. Do you find that to be sort of rare, maybe on TV, or rare to find showrunners, producers to really like encourage you to be experimental? Yeah, I mean, I think more and more with um, now that a lot of the cable shows are mainstream and a lot of sort of the super experimental stuff is uh, more mainstream. And as you know, I think studios, more mainstream studios like, uh, you know, network TV and stuff like that, they're trying 
to catch up. So I think, and you know, I've, I've tried to take that philosophy into the network projects that I've done. I haven't done a lot of network, but I've done a few pilots. And if you, the pilots that I've done, we always like, we're gonna shoot it like it's this is a, a movie. We're not gonna, you know, do the typical, we're gonna break away from the typical network um, language. And I think there's a lot of uh, support when it comes to that. Like now more and more people are like, yeah, we want it to be different. We want it to be, we don't want it the typical, you know, wide shot, close up, uh, super stylized lighting. You know, we wanted, we wanted something more. So I do think that more and more it's, um, it's, it's um, becoming the norm that you, you can create a visual style that's super strong and you'll get supported. Um, earlier, a few years back, it wasn't like that. And then sometimes, you know, I work on a couple of projects that you come in and you try to reinvent the wheel a little bit and you find a lot of resistance and it's just not easy to do. But I think more and more it's, it's the new norm. People are um, experimenting. That's awesome. I mean, I, you can definitely feel that as a consumer too, you know, as someone who's watching content and feeling how, uh, I think, what's it, uh, it's almost like consumer literacy or like viewing literacy. You know, I think people are getting smarter to higher quality content, you know? So I think that's why, I mean, some network stuff is really trying to like catch up because people are Completely. almost more used to it, you know? Yeah. And sometimes you still get uh, comments from from the network, I've been doing a little bit of, uh, of directing and um, you still, you know, you go for something bold and I've tried and you still get some comments from the studio saying, yeah, you know, we don't know if the audience is gonna get this, so let's make mm -hmm. it a little safer. But that's definitely um, um, trust if you wanna push the boundaries, there is trust and there's like, yeah, let's do it, you know? Still a little more conservative, but, but, um, but they're, they're trying to catch up, which is great. Uh, speaking about directing, do you want to maybe speak more about your collaborations with directors as a DP and maybe too about your collaborations with DP as a director? Yeah, sure. Like uh, for me, when I, I mean, I was to uh, work with a lot of different directors. That's a nice thing about episodic. And you have people who, you know, come in and say, I want the camera here with this lens all the way to someone who's like, I don't care. I just, I'm gonna deal with the actors, you shoot the scene. And this has been, you know, so you learn a lot. And then after a few years of that, I realized this is kind of like I always um, thought, you know, directing was interesting for me. Um, and then just having the tools from shooting that you know how much time it takes to do things, you know how to administer a day. It makes you very proficient in, uh, in um, the language of, a film in a way because you you uh, you become an expert of uh, solving problems you know so if if that's the case then I do I do think it's it's a really great tool to have um, all the basically all your past as a, a DP for to transition to directing you know and then for me when I've been directing I I, I was a little worried I was going to be super micromanager of the DP but I really I've been able to let go. Of course, I've been lucky to be working with some amazing people that you know, you know, it's like, well, you shoot the show normally. So what am I going to come here to tell you? you yeah. Know, so you just let them, let them do it. You trust that they know, you collaborate. And then uh, you, I mean, in a way I've been even like helping, you know, it's like sometimes if the AD is starting to get nervous, I'm like, you know, give them time. They're lighting this. You know, I try to be more like a filter of saying, yeah. Don't pressure the DP, you know, because I've I've been on that under that pressure. Yeah. So again, let's just collaborate and, and really learn. And then of course, once you direct, you come back to shooting. It's great because then you're like, I mean, it's humbling. You come back and you say, well, if you're thinking of a hundred things that you think when you're shooting, as a director, you have to think of those plus another hundred that you don't see when you know on prep, actors, casting. Uh, post, you know, things like we don't really deal with as, a, as DPs, you know, so it, it, it makes you be more like a better collaborator and it makes you um, be also just more humble in, in, in when it comes to decision making to helping the director, if there's a difficult day, how to make it so he gets what he needs and then just understand that he has to deal with the actors and you normally don't. So also that's kind of a huge thing, you know, you have to try to create the space for him to deal with the, with the actors in a comfortable way with no pressure from 
your department, you know? So that's what you learn also when you, when you direct. Would, is there a, a certain director or a producer even that you've worked with the longest? Or have you kind of been sort of getting to know a lot of people in your career? I guess I bounced with a lot of, just a lot of different people. I and mean, then of course you, after, I think after a while, you do realize that you like a certain group of people and that you develop relationships. And then when the project's over, they, those go dip to different areas. So you, that's also how you multiply your contacts. You know, that's, yeah. that's a nice thing about, about episodic TV is that, you know, you work with three producers and when the project's over, those three are gonna go away to do each one their own thing. Directors, you maybe work with like, I mean, for me, maybe 20 different directors. They're all gone doing their own thing. They all know you, you work with them for like an intense month period. So that becomes how you make your own network, you know? Um, in terms of uh, the same people, I, I kind of gravitate now that I'm, I have a little more experience just to find the people that I like to work with, you know, I like, and I, I don't know who said this, I think it's, um, I think it was Joe Bantoliano, the actor saying, you know, it, it's, it's already hard enough as a job to work with people that you don't like. So if you can find people that you know, that, that you like, and then you can, you can have a nice, um, a nice time, a good time, why not, you know? And um, that's kind of what I've been trying to do. And sometimes, of course, it's hard to um, to know. But in general, I do think there's a tendency in, um, in our world for people to be a little more, to enjoy more the work, you know? Like, I think the old school times where people are like, you know, shouting and yelling, it's not very common anymore. You still see it. And I think it's gonna change. But I do think that's um, it's rare, you know. It's, it's become more of people. People respect everyone, and people understand, and you know. So that's that's kind of my hope. Uh, let's see here. I feel like I have so many questions to ask you. I'm trying to decide which ones to go because I could talk to you all day. Mm -hmm. But um, let me say, um, oh, this is a good one. Uh, in our, I hate to use even use the word normal, but in our world before COVID nineteen. Um, when you're just working, going along, making connections, how would you, as a creative person, stay inspired between projects? Like to kind of maybe refuel yourself and your inspirations for things. Yeah. I think it's, it's for me, it's probably the hardest part from my career has been when you have time off to not be freaking out about what's <laughs> coming next. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the nature of everyone. I, I work with this uh, gaffer in Los Angeles, uh, John Tower, who was, uh, he was awesome because he has so much experience. And then every time we'd finish a project and I, you know, I kind of started working with him. And of course it would be like, maybe I have a commercial now and I don't have anything for the next month. I would be kind of freaking out. And he's like, don't worry, it will come. You know, you just have to be, he would used to say, just go, you know, do something else. Go, he used to do a lot of uh, biking. So, you know, find a hobby and just do it. And then what I've done the last, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how, how long, but uh, just photography for me, just I take my camera, go out, take stills, put them in the computer, play with it. Now I'm, uh, I'm drawing and painting and doing things like that, that still in a way builds up to your, um, it's not something that just, it's unusable. You actually use it when you work. So I've been trying to find those, those hobbies. But I do think it's important to recharge and then try to, you know, find stuff that you um, haven't seen. You watch some movies. It's always inspiration when you watch something like, oh, I want to do a movie like this or I want to, or just kind of inform yourself on a, on a subject. Um, really kind of study. You just become um, constantly studying stuff that, that uh, I'm interested in. And um, now I don't really think too much about what, comes next. I mean, you still get nervous, of course, because you don't know, especially now with, uh, with COVID and stuff. You're like, I, I don't know what, what's going to happen. But I find that it's just silly to worry about things you can't control. So for me, it's like, well, I can control what I'm doing now and I can be in evolving my photography. I can do, I can learn other things, but I can't really control when the business is going to go back open. And yeah. 
So it's just kind of do your thing and, and just concentrate and try to recharge, you know, like watching movies, reading, doing photography, stuff like that. Are there certain movies that you can always go back to? Like you can put on any of this guy's stuff or watch this and like always be like, oh, this is so good. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a few films like that. I love sort of the, if there's, for example, I, I don't have a TV now, but if I'm in lo on location and yeah, I have a, a television, the typical one that I you play and it's always kind of playing is like Casino, Goodfell, stuff like that. I love just having that play. <laughs> Um, and then just, I can watch any movie that um, Roger Dickens has shot. I can watch that a thousand times and not get tired. And then I can watch Kubrick, a lot of Kubrick, and David Fincher, uh, P.T. Anderson, other DPs like Rodrigo Prieto, Lueski, you know, I mean, there's so, there's so many good people out there, good projects that I can just watch over and over. And of course, you know, Blade Runner, it's still probably the movie that I watched the most, the most times. And I still watch it again and I'm completely blown away by it. Because every time you discover something new or you see it with different eyes because you just did something different. So it's a kind of a constant reevaluation of of the same uh, projects, you know? Yeah, actually I, I rewatched Casino uh, the other day and I was, we're watching it. My partner and I are watching a bunch of Scorsese films and it was just wild. I just, after kind of going in between watching TV and random stuff and the news, and then to watch that, it was just so refreshing. And to think of these like bold films that have been made, it was just really remarkable to see how much and how, like how much content was happening at you. And also like how much camera movement was involved, even just in the start mm. of the movie. Like I, it's something I've noticed watching TV at, or, you know, watching movies at home versus like going to the theater. It's like if you um, look at how much time has passed when you're watching, and it's something I've been thinking yeah, yeah, about yeah. a lot. It's like, oh my gosh, so much movie happened in the first 20 minutes. Like that would be equivalent <laughs> to, you know, some TV shows at like 45 minutes and it's kind of like flat. And I was like, wow, yeah, he said so much in 20 minutes and I still have got another two hours of this. Yeah, it's amazing. It's pretty wild. It's amazing. So yeah, and then sometimes it's uh, just rediscovering stuff. You know, if you, if you, um, watch a movie. I, I do think it's hard to concentrate on a lot of things if you're analyzing a project. So I sometimes just concentrate on I'm just gonna look at the lighting, you know, or mm. gonna look at the exteriors, how they made the exteriors. Or, and then I try sometimes to just look at stuff that would be inspiring for either something I'm trying to, I'm working on, on, or just something that I want to learn that I don't think I know how to do. Then I'll try to, to learn from those how those people solve the problems, you know, like just the big. Uh, amazing DPs that we have available. Yeah, for, for example, with like period films and making period TV shows, are there certain ones that you go to to like look at for reference? Yeah, I mean, for, um, funny enough, for, for our show, we didn't really look at a lot of period references for TV because there are really not that many. I mean, now there's a lot. I mean, funny enough, after uh, us, there was a lot of projects and now there's even like projects very similar in terms of alternate history, 1950. So that's kind of cool, you know, that um, you kind of open, open that door. Um, I do, I don't know, I mean, I think, I, it's, it's my, it's my yeah, I think um, I watched, I mean, I, I, I don't look at a lot of TV references just because I, I still think, um, Film is kind of a stronger source of inspiration for me. But I did watch some of uh, Steven Soderbergh's The Nick, which is, I mean, it's period, it's earlier, but it's still so smartly done. It's really intelligent the way they did it, the way they, the way he photographs in a way that you don't have to show the whole set. He's very efficient also on just covering scenes with maybe just one moving master and one shot. And so I watched that a lot, but it was more just for the, um, not so much for the lighting, but maybe just for the, the way that he handles camera, coverage, time, and then just shooting in a period world that with a limited budget, because even though that was a, a big project, still not a huge budget. Um, and then sometimes I like to watch sort of uh, the mainstream shows that everyone watches, like, you know, Game of Thrones, just to see how they did it. 
and then what what I like and what I don't like about it, and then try to just go from there. It's more like an exercise in in taste and seeing what I like and what mm. I don't like. This is more than taking references, you know. It's like okay, I don't like how they did this. You know, sometimes it just you kind of define your taste by what you see, and then that's kind of a nice way of uh, of you know exercising that. Would you say there are very specific still photographers that you reference or made painters that you go to as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's so many, there's so many good painters and photographers and uh, I'm, I'm still kind of love um, sort of the journalistic um, street photographers from like 40s, 50s, 60s, from like Cartier-Bresson, Cortez and, and all of those guys. And then a little more to the, uh, in color, you know, so I do, I do like I do see a lot of photography, but it depends on the project. Like sometimes I have the the, the people I go back to just on my regular off time. But then if I'm looking at a reference for a movie, then I'll be like, okay, maybe Eggleston or same thing. I try to see how they solve um, color, how how they deal with color and certain things, how they deal with black and white, framing stuff like that from from different photographers. And same thing with paintings. I, I do kind of. Like also depending on the on the project, I I just have faces. You know, I have a face where I really like Hopper, and then I just look at Hopper every day. And then um, I don't know uh, um, Andy Waith or uh, contemporary painters, so just classical painters too. You know, like uh, the Dutch painters and Spanish painters, and just really anything that you see will kind of stay. So I do try to take care of what I see, in a way. Because I do think everything you kind of see ends up reflecting in your work, so it's hard to choose. But I try to I try to do it, you know, to just kind of watch what what material you see, so you it kind of comes out in a nice way. Yeah. Would you say that those inspirations or hobbies or influences have have changed at all during COVID? Or like, I'm just curious what that's like for you to be inspired now that it's all this. Um, Kind of like unexpected time off you know yeah i mean the, for sure i mean i guess what it, what this um covid phase has been doing for us I, for me it just puts things on, on perspective so i do think that i've been gravi gravitating to stuff that's more relevant way staying a little more i don't know I just trying to find stuff that's a little more relevant and then of course with the last latest couple of weeks with uh you know with a protest on the street and the black lives matter and stuff just really trying to inform myself and then you know as a foreigner what does it mean i have a kind of an idea of what it means you know racism in the u.s but i want to kind of inform myself now that i live here for for a long time and then same thing visually you know if you can open your uh, areas to to um reference that you've never seen you know maybe some uh, african-american uh, photographers or same thing for um for content in general you know and i think so i think COVID has kind of helped me it does make you a little more focused because you do realize sort of the fragility of everything and it, it kind of makes you stay away from the superficial uh you know pictures of cats and stuff and, and really try to go so that's more relevant. So I've been kind of clean, <laughs> cleaning my um, social network um, accounts when it comes to what I see, because I also wanted to gravitate towards stuff that's more relevant. You know, if you're going to use it, then I, I think I wanted to use it in a responsible way, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely uh, what I think is actually the really like fascinating side of what our world's going to be like. It's weird to say after, but you know, when more of the, the country uh, is open. Uh, how much more maybe relevant our content will be and the, the people making those stories will be because it just seems like so much life has happened like I don't know how like, you know someone mentioned on social media like like how could you go back to working on say like a show that's glorifies cops just being buds or you know like it's interesting to yeah, that absolutely. whole like you know hero complex with certain either military or certain branches of the government. And I'm curious what that's gonna be like for, um, you know, storytellers to see, yeah. you know, hopefully that could change, but we'll, we'll see, you know? 
Yeah. No, and you know, I've, I've um, I worked the, the project that I directed the most is uh, a military show about Navy SEALs. But the nice thing about that um, project since the beginning is it was kind of an anti-hero stance on, on mm. the military. It's more like, well, these people are just like everyone else and they have their own issues. And, um, and actually, in a way, sort of the struggle of, uh, of their life, combining their life as a regular American with the life of um, someone who doesn't know if he's going to come back when, every time he goes to a mission, you know? So, yeah. And then the people that we've uh, advised us there in that show, they're all uh, Navy SEALs, retired Navy SEALs. And uh, so in a way you do get closer to, uh, to the human aspect of it. So I think if you, if you, those projects in a way, instead of glorifying the concept of the military, if you can go to the human aspect of it, I think then you're doing something responsible, you know? And I think that's why um, I'm, I'm kind of very proud of having part of that show. That's awesome. Well, I wanted to thank you again so much for your time. I don't want to take up your whole afternoon, but is there maybe anything else you'd like to add or say towards either, I don't know, young people in the industry or just even the people that are in the industry? They're like, what are we going to do now? Like, is there anything that you feel that has maybe helped you? I feel probably to young people would be just, I mean, for now, normally I would say film is a very tricky to get into break into film or television or any medium so i would say just they were probably going to need extra patience if we already it's already kind of a slow uh, race like you know stamina it's really there's really no finish line then they're gonna have to in, endure even more of that because now i mean nobody knows what's gonna happen but in a way i do think that people who are younger probably have, have to have they're gonna have more trouble trying to break in just because they'll be if they'll be more content but at the same time they'll be need for more experience and how to manage those new demands in a in a way that has uh, you know with experience crew in a way so i, I do think it's going to be hard for people who are starting and um but at the same time maybe it's a, a rebirth of independent small projects so you know why not so yeah um just kind of believing that you can do it and just doing doing your own thing you know well we'll see, <laughs> we'll I mean, see. that's all we can do right exactly well thank you again so much for your time really appreciate it and i'm really excited yeah, yeah. to check out all your new shows you've got so many new shows now so right I gotta watch them all <laughs> we got the time right so yeah exactly <laughs> watch them all now Okay. Thanks so much, Gonzalo. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.